my name is David Bond uh, and I'm currently on the board of AFANS and I'd just like to very much thank you all for joining us today for what will be a fascinating insight series workshop, uh, the sixth so far that we've had. Um, before I do move on to the speakers, uh, I would like to acknowledge the, the traditional custodians of the Kamaragal people um, of the lands that I'm speaking to you from today. Um, I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands of which each of you are living, learning and working from as well. Uh, I pay my respects to their elders past and present. As mentioned before, we do have a fascinating workshop. Um, it is with the greatest of pleasure that I introduce our workshop speakers today. Uh, we have Professor Ann Tarka and Raphael Makowski uh, from the IASB. Um, I will, these aren't their full bios because if they were, they'd probably stretch the entire, the entire session today. So we'll, we'll keep it relatively brief. But for those that don't know Anne, um, Anne joined the IASB uh, from the University of Western Australia's Business School, uh, where she was an accounting teacher and researcher uh, since 1996 and a professor since 2011. Um, she served as a member of the AASB from 2014 to 17 and was a research director from the AASB from February, February 2017. Uh, she was an academic fellow of the IFRS Foundation 2011 to 2012, authored a textbook on accounting and has written a wide range of research papers relating to IFRS standards for which she has received many awards. She's an active member of the International Accounting Academic Community, having served on several boards and committees. Um, so Anne, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, David. No problems. And Raphael, uh, Raphael Murkowski is a member of the IASB's technical staff and has more than 10 years of work experience in applying IFRS standards. Before joining the IFRS Foundation, he worked as an auditor of financial institutions and as a preparer in the banking and IT sectors. He holds a bachelor's degree in business management from Edinburgh Napier University and a master's degree in economics from the University of Economics in Krakow, Poland. Uh, he is an AACA member and a CPA in Poland. The focus of this workshop, as for those that saw the invitation, uh, it'll provide an overview of the third agenda consultation um, and seek feedback from practitioners and researchers on what the IASB's priorities should be over the next five years. Uh, the IASB and certainly Anne and, and Raffle here today are interested in hearing about any research relevant to decisions about potential projects. Um, in terms of housekeeping, uh, it is um, a, you know, a relatively intimate group. Um, so we're happy to take questions or so say we, Anne and, and Raphael are happy to take questions as we move through. Um, but rather than um, just ask out, out aloud, if you could, if I could ask you to either raise your hand um, or put a question in the chat and I'll be able to find a suitable moment to um, have that question put to Anne and Raphael or question or comment. Uh, so without further ado, I'll leave it over to Anne and Raphael to take us through um, take us through the session. Thanks, David. And thanks once again to AFANS for the great support that they provided to the IASB today and on other occasions. So it's with great pleasure that um, myself and uh, Raffel speak to you today on the Agenda Consultation Project. Uh, the session is being recorded, so is available for other people to listen to later. And as always in these presentations, the views expressed are those of the individuals and not the IASB or the IFRS Foundation. We have many materials that are relevant to this presentation available on our website, and you can see the link there on slide three and also at the end of our session today. There are many other links and materials available. So going now to the next slide, I'll give you an introduction about uh, what we're going to cover. Um, so both uh, Raffle and myself will be sp we're speaking, and as David says, um, with this size of audience, very happy to take comments and questions as we go. So just indicate that you would like to do that. So next slide, please. And next slide, yeah, thank you. Um, so firstly, uh, I just follow on from David, the objectives of the session. So we want to give you an overview of what is in the IASB's request for information on this topic. And that helps people as they gather their feedback and provide comment letters to us. Um, secondly, this session gives you the opportunity to ask us questions on any matters and share your comments. Um, and thirdly, in particular for this audience, please let us know of any research that you think is relevant 
to the projects we're considering. If you look into the RFI, you see there's a lot of detail on the types of projects that the IASB could consider. And the thing that will help us decide about prioritising those projects will be the feedback we get from sessions like this, the comment letters, but also research that gives us empirical evidence to help us understand the nature of the issues, their prevalence, the impact for stakeholders will help the board when the board makes decisions about prioritising projects, about the size and scope of those projects. Uh, so with that, if we could go, um, no, Raffle, don't go anywhere. Stop on slide six and we'll talk about that one. Um, this slide is entitled Setting the Scene because we want to distinguish between what's happening in the third agenda consultation and the strategy review that's been carried out by the IFRS Foundation trustees. So in terms of the agenda consultation, we're looking for feedback for us to set the scope of the work of the IASB over the next three years. So the current scope of the work of the IASB is about financial statements, management commentary for for-profit oriented companies. Now this is a different set of considerations to those that are going on with the IFRS Foundation trustees. So the trustees have a consultation period that's been going now for some time and they've been consulting with stakeholders about whether uh, there is interest and appetite and support and resources for the setting up of an International Sustainability Standards Board. And a decision on that will be made by ahead of November 2020, uh, meeting going ahead in um, Glasgow. So there's been a lot of um, feedback and consideration that the IFRS Foundation trustees have been examining. And if that area of work is of interest, um, you can uh, consult our website and there's a lot more detail there about the progress of that consultation. But back to agenda consultation, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of objectives and timeline, the IASB does a public consultation on its activities uh, on its work plan every five years. And this is the third time that the board has consulted on its priorities. So the agenda consultation gathers feedback on the strategic direction and the balance of the board's activities. The agenda consultation has criteria for assessing the priority of financial reporting issues that could be added to the work plan. And there's consideration of new financial reporting issues that could be given priority. The responses that we get help shape priorities for the next five years. So in this case, it will be 2022 through to 2026. Um, in setting these priorities, the board also considers its own expertise and experience. Even after priorities are set, the board still has capacity for urgent projects. And for example, that's what's happened recently as we, the board has looked at eyeball reform and also COVID related rent concessions. On this slide, we can see the key dates. The comment period will end the end of September of 2021. The board will start deliberations in the final quarter of 2021. And we expect to publish a work plan and feedback statement in the second quarter of 2022. Um, you can see a little blue arrow there indicating our new chair. So Andreas Barkov has joined the IASB as chair and the meeting that we have just completed in July marked his first time as chair. Can I, can I actually ask a question in relation yes. to that? Um, yes, and I don't right. know to what extent um, it is possible to comment on it, but given how recently the new chair has joined and, and how this sort of fits in with the next five year and the timing of that in, in terms of the next five year plan, do you feel like there's any sort of major sort of any shifts in direction or things that have been brought to the table which is a slightly different direction than what was previous um well andreas has been involved in standard setting for a very long time 
both yep. in terms of being involved at an international level with the IASB and also previously, as many know, he headed the German National Standard mm -hmm. Center. So he has a great deal of experience. And so he is really up to date on all the projects. And he's been working with the IASB for three months in a transition period. So he's very well placed to know what the work is and also to understand the um, the environment, to understand what's important to stakeholders, the type of things that people have been asking about, issues that have been bubbling away for some time. Uh, but Andreas will also work with consensus. So he'll work with board, staff, trustees, advisory council, and all those types of bodies to determine um, what, what projects should be taken on. So it, it is decision making by committee in that sense. So while Andreas will provide leadership and he will have his ideas about where priorities should lie, um, those ideas will be influenced by the people he's working with, by his board, by staff and by the consultation process. So um, uh, to, further to answer your questions, um, no, no indications yet of, of a change of direction and uh, indeed um, it, Andreas has made two or three public statements already about the work plan and, and things that are going on, but they're at a high level at this stage because we, we are in an active consultation. Raffle, do you want to add anything at this stage? That's, that covers everything, as you said. Okay. We're very early okay. at the consultation, so we will see what will come up of the consultation. And once we get to the decisions uh, by the board, we will know more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, slide eight, if I may. So for this agenda consultation, we issued a request for information. Um, and there are three parts to that. So there's the board's activities, there's criteria for assessing uh, new projects that are added to the work plan, and then looking at new financial reporting issues. So what we can see in this slide, uh, point one, strategic direction and balance of the board's activities. What we've tried to show in the diagram is the type of things that the board currently works on. Uh, it's not a diagram to scale, so it doesn't indicate the balance of time that we spend on things. But a, a big area of work uh, for the board is uh, the development of new standards and carrying out uh, major amendments to IFRS standards. Another very important area of work is maintenance and consists, consistent application of IFRS standards. So we have the Interpretations Committee that's very actively involved in that area of work, and they are supported by staff who are working on, on issues related to maintenance and consistent application, as well as supporting the work of the Interpretations Committee. Another area of work that has been active in the last couple of years is the IFRS for SME standard, the review that we've been undertaking. Um, also in the diagram, digital financial reporting. So uh, many jurisdictions are engaged with uh, considering the developments in digital financial reporting and the IASB is very much part of that, thinking about how our standards are written and having an accompanying taxonomy, an IFRS taxonomy that goes with that. So there's the, the request for information asks about the strategic direction of our activities and the balance of them. Um, the RFI gives you the criteria for assessing priority uh, and the RFI lists details of many projects that could potentially be added. So all that details there to allow people to consider a range of projects and give us our views on them. Uh, so I think um, I'll pause and see if there's any comments or questions before I hand over to Raphael to continue with the presentation. No, all silent. Okay, Rafael, over to you. Yes, thank you and, and good afternoon everybody. So as, as Anne said, the balance of the board's activities is an important part of this agenda consultation. And we have not focused on this area in detail in previous two agenda consultations. However, does, uh, the board does a lot more than standard setting and what you can see at the board table. And we also operate in dynamic environment and changes in the environment will affect the board's priorities. 
Uh, so while I'm sure it's tempting to focus on the specific projects and future priorities that the board could have with work plan, uh, please bear in mind that if you have any strong views on the direction and overall balance of our activities, we would like to hear your views on that. Uh, and we look forward to your feedback on the question, the request for information on this first objective. And as you can see on this slide, we would like to hear your rationale for why the board should increase, leave unchanged or decrease its current level of focus on each activity. And to the extent possible, it would be very useful feedback for, for the board and for the staff if you can specify the types of work within each activity that the board should do more or less of. And then finally, if you have any thoughts on other activities within the current scope of the board's work uh, that the board should undertake, we would like to hear that. And just to remind you, the current scope of the board's work is what Anne mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. It's a financial statements and management commentary for profit-oriented companies. And uh, to help you respond uh, on the first uh, part of the consultation on the strategic direction and balance of the board's activities, uh, we have in the request for information in the consultation document, we have included an estimate of how the board's resources are currently deployed across the board's six main activities. And we want to hear your views on whether this current balance is appropriate for the next five years, or if we should make changes to the level of focus on any one of them. And one of the challenges is limited capacity. Uh, and I am referring here to both the board's capacity and uh, stakeholders' capacity to engage with us throughout our due process. Uh, and therefore, please keep in mind that increasing the allocation of resources to one or more of the board's activities would mean fewer resources are available for other activities. And with that, I will now talk about each of the six main activities in more detail. So the first activity should be self-explanatory. It is delivering new IFRS standards or major amendments to the standards. It's all about our research, uh, standard setting projects and required post-implementation reviews. Uh, the, level, the level of focus on this activity affects the number of new financial reporting projects that the board uh, can start over the next five years. And more focus means more new projects and we will cover uh, this future capacity later in this webinar. And uh, we are also aware, based on our preliminary feedback and on outreach, based on outreach events that we've heard, uh, that we've held so far, uh, that something, the time is right for a stable platform. And uh, because having spent time, energy, and resources on the implementation of IFRS 9, 15, 16, and very recently IFRS 17, some stakeholders think that the ISB should provide a period of relative calm. And we understand that view. However, one thing to consider is that if any of the major projects on the board's current work plan is finalized, it will still be some years before they are effective. And certainly any new projects that might be added to the work plan as a result of this agenda consultation are not expected to be completed within the five year cycle because the life cycle of any project is between five to seven years. So that's, that's quite important to, to keep in mind. Uh, and that means adding new projects to the work plan as a result of this agenda consultation does not necessarily conflict with having a stable platform. Uh, the next activity, maintenance and consistent application of the standards. As Anne mentioned, together with the IFRS Interpretations Committee, the board helps stakeholders obtain a common understanding of financial reporting requirements in several different ways. And this work helps support the consistent application of the standards so that they are globally comparable. And as you can see on this slide, activities include monitoring consistent application, to respond in a timely and effective fashion to, to submissions to the committee and addressing application challenges through agenda decisions, narrow scope amendments and educational materials. And if the board were to focus more resources on this activity, it could, for example, address application challenges through new channels to support emerging economies and new adopters. And this is just one of the examples of what more the board could do. And if you have any, any other suggestions, we would like to hear them. And in terms of um, these new channels for emerging economies and new adopters, because this is an area where we receive quite a lot of uh, requests, this might include capacity building efforts through tailored 
regional IFRS training workshops and case studies that develop capacity to make judgments to apply the requirements in, in the standards. Okay. If I could jump in really quickly on that. Um, I don't know if there'll be more sort of opportunities down the line, but I figure we're on the slide. Um, and this may reference um, Raffle or my sort of previous time with the um, IFRS when I was involved um, as an academic fellow and involved with, with Mike's team on the education side of things. Um, is there opportunity, I know capacity is obviously an issue in terms of time and just sort of, sort of people power to be able to, to put, um, to devote those resources to things. But I look at that published, the published educational materials and then how to sort of build on that and work, um, you know, obviously on a global level. Is there opportunity to work um, similar to how some of the post-implementation post reviews have been done and in research and involving researchers from out, obviously people outside of the IFRS Foundation and the IASB to help, you know, to help work on IFRS projects and ISB projects. Is there, is there potentially an opportunity to, to work with academics from around the world on um, some way to, in some way on those educational materials side of things? I think there is always, uh, we're always interested in hearing um, any evidence or research uh, that supports standard setting, whether it be on the uh, research phase of any project or whether it's later in the in the project cycle when it's already in the exposure draft stage. I think it was, I was more getting at, is there an opportunity for, I suppose, academics to work in some way to create material for the IFRS Foundation? If that's something that it makes sense for them, but also is something of value to, to the organization. I think Anne wanted to add something, but, but you're muted, Anne. So. Um, yes, David, uh, you're mentioning the specific education materials that both you and I worked on previously yep. um, in, in education. And so uh, that set of education materials that belongs to the IFRS for SME standard was completely revised and an entire new set was completed by probably 2020. Yep. And that they are, um, they're very well received. So it's a good question from you whether the IASB could take um, work with others, work with people external mm. to the organisation and do more in terms of education materials. And, and certainly that's a point that we'd be interested in receiving feedback on and, and if people wish to pass that comment along, because that, that type of comment would fit in well with the comments we receive about people wanting more time on maintenance and consistent application. So there mm. are stakeholders for whom that is a very important area reflecting what Raphael just said about the stable platform. It goes hand in hand with that. So another side to that would be more um, education or, or training materials. And, and then the question becomes how to do it. And it may yeah. be appropriate. So the, the, um, the ISB has partnered with various people at different times. It partners with national standard setters in yep. terms of getting research projects up and going. Um, and it certainly gets work from um, academics through research, through the research forum, yep. through journal special issues and, and that sort of thing. And the literature reviews for the post-implementation reviews, uh, on occasion they've been done by uh, consultation following a public tender. So that, that all of that um, history of working with outsiders is there. And it may be that's something that comes out of the gender consultation that, that um, people suggest and something that we can pick up on and, and do more of. Cool, thank you. I will just add to that that uh, some things cannot be outsourced because we have due process and that due process needs to be followed. And uh, even though we receive a lot of some feedback about partnering with others in some areas, uh, we need to be mindful of that constraints of the due process that we need still to, uh, to follow in, in any activities, uh, including educational materials to some extent. That's also quite important. Uh, so, yes, already mentioned IFRS for SME standards, so we also have separate standards for companies that do not have public accountability. Uh, and today we maintain the standard through periodic reviews, uh, and one of such reviews is currently underway, 
and we also publish educational materials to support the greater understanding and consistent application of the standard. And in terms of what more the board could do, the board could research, uh, for example, the causes of uh, limited and inconsistent adoption of the standard and partner with national standard setters uh, to see why the adoption of the standard is quite limited. And just to provide you with some figures, the standard is required or permitted uh, in 86 jurisdictions compared to 144 jurisdictions that require or permit the use of full IFRS standards. But these are just some, some examples of, of future focus. Then we have digital financial reporting. As Anne said, with the increasing consumption of financial reports in a digital format, uh, we often hear calls for the board to devote more resources to considering the interplay between technology and financial reporting. And our current focus and historical focus is on supporting the IFRS taxonomy, which is used to tag financial information so that it can be consumed digitally. And our work in that respect is largely to update the IFRS taxonomy for any new or amended standards and to reflect common reporting practice. And we also work to ensure that new requirements are technology neutral, that is the requirements can work in both a paper-based world and a digital financial report. And if we were to devote more resources uh, to support digital consumption of financial reports, the question becomes, uh, what further activities should the board undertake? And on this slide, on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see some examples. So the board could stick to its historical focus, the IFRS taxonomy, and improve it to better meet the needs of the market. Uh, the board could also give greater consideration to how presentation and disclosure requirements in IFRS standards can be enhanced to facilitate digital consumption of financial reports. And one example of that is moving from a technology neutral perspective to developing the requirements to a technology first perspective. And that shift in perspective could mean, for example, uh, that the board requires even more granular information to be presented and disclosed, because as we all know, uh, technology allows us to process lots, lots of data in an even more efficient way. So there are practically no constraints of how much information can be presented and disclosed in a digital format. And the board could also work with more, work more with others in the broader digital ecosystem towards realizing the benefits of high quality and globally comparable financial reports that we can see on paper in a digital world. And that would mean identifying partners that, uh, that control adoption of the IFRS taxonomy and identifying those that control the quality of electronic data, as well as those that facilitate the accessibility of digital reports and working in partnership with all these market players uh, to bring such a world to fruition. Uh, so there are different types of work that the board could do if it were to focus more on digital financial reporting uh, in the future, in the next five years. And all of these board's activities that I've described so far are integrated to some degree. However, there are two cross-cutting activities, and one is understandability and accessibility of the standards, and the other is stakeholder engagement. And uh, when it comes to understandability and accessibility, uh, is an area. This is an area where uh, the board is already very active, and our work here is primarily about helping users of the standards. Uh, so companies, auditors, regulators, and national standard setters, and better understand the requirements so they can in turn provide information that is most useful to investors. And uh, within this context, and within the context of individual projects, we take care to reduce unnecessary complexity and costs while improving the quality of information for investors. And in addition, we put a lot we put in a lot of effort to ensure that our requirements are clearly drafted, um, leveraging the expertise of our editorial and translations team, as well as external reviewers. So there is quite a, a rigid process that we have for, uh, for how we draft the standards. And with accessibility, for instance, we publish annotated versions of the standards, including uh, agenda decisions and cross-references to other materials and provide tools for easier navigation of the electronic version of our standards. And we have very recently updated the electronic navigator of uh, IFRS standards on our website. And if we were to increase the level of focus on this activity, we could, for example, take a comprehensive look at different areas and causes of, of unnecessary complexity in our requirements today. 
or we could explore whether and how we could change the way standards are developed so they are more clearly articulated using more consistent terminology and structure where it is practical and, and helpful to do so. And that approach could then be applied to already existing standards or could be applied in developing new standards. So quite interesting ideas here. Um, and with accessibility, we could increase our use of technology and other tools, such as flowcharts and tailoring tools, to help stakeholders find materials that are most relevant to them and help them understand how those materials relate to each other rather than uh, going through all the requirements in the standards. So, uh, so to enable uh, users of the standards to quickly find materials that are most relevant to them and to their fact patterns and transactions that they are dealing with. And finally, stakeholder engagement, which, as I said, is cross-cutting activity. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see some examples of further initiatives the board could pursue if additional resources were devoted to this activity. And currently, we spend around 20-25% of uh, stakeholder engagement, so it's already quite high. Uh, so I will pause to see if there are any questions before we move on to the second and third objectives of the consultation and i can see okay message in the chat which is not related to the which is not a question okay so the next part of the consultation is about the criteria that the board proposes to use in assessing the priority of financial reporting issues that could be added to its work plan for 2022 to 2026 and in this part of the consultation we are seeking uh, your feedback, whether the board has identified the right criteria and whether it should consider any other criteria. And in this part of the consultation and in that last part of the consultation, we are focusing strictly on new IFS standards and major amendments to IFS standards. In other words, research and standard setting projects only rather than the overall balance of the board's activities. So we are going into more uh, specific area, which consumes 40 to 45 percent of the board's uh, resources currently. And the, both, the proposed criteria are uh, included on this slide. So uh, these are the importance of the matter to, to the primary users of financial statements, not only investors. This is just uh, to make it more accessible. Uh, so we are thinking about all the primary users of financial statements. Another criterion is uh, whether there is a deficiency in current reporting the type of companies affected and jurisdictions where the matter is more prevalent, how pervasive the matter is, the potential project's interaction with other projects, the complexity and feasibility of the potential project and its solutions, and the capacity of the board, the staff, and its stakeholders to progress the potential project. And all of these criteria are covered by the overarching consideration of a project meeting the needs of investors while taking into account the costs of producing the information by preparers. And the final bit I'd like to highlight on the criteria is that they are subjective, so it won't be an exact science when the board actually comes to use them. Uh, it's going to require the board to make judgments, so how the board will assess the relative importance of each criterion will vary depending on the particular project. This is a very short part of the consultation. It covers the seven criteria and I'm looking into the chat box. I can't see any questions and I'm moving to the third objective of the agenda consultation, which is financial reporting issues that could be added to the board's work plan for 2022 to 2026. And just to give you a little bit of background and uh, how we have arrived at estimated future board's capacity uh, the priorities for the 2022 to 2026 work plan are included on this slide. And uh, the, the assumption is that the board will continue prioritizing projects already on its work plan because these projects were identified previously by stakeholders as priorities and uh, reprioritizing could lead to inefficient starts and stops. So that's the assumption that we are consulting with. Uh, the board is also committed and required to undertake several post-implementation reviews of, uh, uh, we have already underway the PIR of IFRS 10, 11, 12 and the PIR of classification and measurement requirements of IFRS 9, but there are some more PIRs that are required to be undertaken uh, in the next five years and this is uh, 
the ECL model, so impairment requirements in IFRS 9 and hedge, hedging requirements, and also IFRS 15 and IFRS 16. And this time we have also set aside some um, capacity for urgent issues that may arise between the consultations. Uh, and this was the case with this consult uh, with the previous consultation because once the priorities have been set, the board added some urgent projects to its work plan, for example, IBO reform and its effects on financial reporting and COVID-19 related rent concessions. So specific amendments to IFRS 16. And pulling all these together, assuming the board continues to allocate 40 to 45% of its resources to this activity, uh, we find that our capacity to work on new projects is limited to only two to three large projects, four to five medium projects, or seven to eight small projects for an equivalent combination of large, medium, small projects. And it's very important um, to, to highlight or rather than and because it's either large or medium or small projects. Unfortunately, unfortunately it's not and between these numbers. So, so the capacity is really limited. And to help stakeholders answer the question about uh, which financial reporting issues should be prioritized and added to the board's work plan, the request for information describes and estimates the size of potential new financial reporting issues. And the list of described financial reporting issues was worked up mainly through our discussions with consultative groups before uh, in preparing for, for this agenda consultation. The objective of putting together that list is primarily to provide all stakeholders with a common understanding of the issues that could be addressed in a potential project. Uh, so for example, if stakeholders suggest the project on cash flows, uh, we wanted to be clear as to whether that would be referring to a fundamental review of IS7 or more targeted review or targeted improvements to the standards. And I should also mention that the list is not exhaustive and does not represent a draft work plan because it is impossible for the board to undertake all the potential projects described. Um, and we are also keen to hear from you on the projects that we think are priority and are not described in the request for information. So the list that we have included on the next slide shouldn't constrain your feedback in any, in any way. And you can see the list of uh, projects that we've described uh, on this slide. For each of these 22 projects, uh, uh, we have described the scope and uh, whether the project is likely to be a small, medium, or a large project. And again, this, these are just estimates, and uh, we hope these estimates will help you uh, to ensure that we have all understanding of what the board can add and, and be realistic about that. Uh, and in this part of the consultation, we are asking about uh, your views on what priority, high, medium, or low, uh, you would give each of these potential projects uh, to be able to compare the uh, the responses and feedback that we receive because uh, for what can be high priority for preparers may be very low priority for users of financial statements so we so that would be very helpful if you could see uh, high medium and low priorities across various uh, regions and various types of stakeholders and within each description we have proposed different types of work that the board could undertake to address the issues identified by stakeholders and uh, as I said, what is important, we aim to gather focused feedback. Therefore, we are asking stakeholders if, prior, if their prioritization refers to all or only specific aspects included in the project description. And later in this webinar, um, Anne will discuss two examples of described projects on the operating segments and the statement of cash flows. And uh, on, on slides 26, 27, and 28, we have included also the information that would be very useful to us uh, because the board is not only interested in, uh, in in the numbers in priorities but also in information that explains stakeholders prioritization so it is not only the level of demand that is important for any particular project but also evidence in relation to the seven criteria that i mentioned in the second part of this webinar and examples of the types of information that uh, that the board and the staff would find useful include whether addressing the issue improves financial reporting for primary users of financial statements as defined in the conceptual framework. Uh, the extent to which existing practice already adequately addresses the issue. Uh, is there a deficiency in reporting? If so, 
is it really due to a gap in the requirements or due to in compliance with the requirements by preparers, by companies? Um, then we also have information such as companies affected and uh, whether the matter is uh, global or more uh, specific to any to a jurisdiction or any particular region. And we also need to think about stakeholders' capacity to be able to engage with the board and um, and provide high quality and timely feedback on the board's proposals. Uh, and the board also needs to think about some internal matters and some uh, and evidence in relation to these points. And these are, for example, interaction of any new projects with projects already underway. Uh, if we had already researched uh, some of the issues and had a relating project on the work plan that did not have successful completion, uh, what should we do differently this time? If the issue relates to the need to use judgment to apply the requirements, is standard setting really a feasible solution? And we also need to think about the capacity of the board and its staff to make timely progress. Uh, so yes, if you have any relevant research and evidence in relation to the criteria and these points, uh, we would like to, to hear that. Uh, Raphael, I think we have a question from Tim. Um, yes. So Tim, I think you're able, you should be able to take yourself off mute. Yep. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, David, and thanks so much, uh, Anne and Ravel, for taking um, the time for uh, giving this really helpful webinar. Um, I have a question around the uh, the fourth point that 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 you've got there, and perhaps more on the specific projects that was proposed. So the interaction with the other projects. Um, my my background is around climate disclosure, and my question is going to come from that kind of direction with the uh, development of. Uh, the proposed development of the uh, IWSB. So in particular, the management commentary as well is currently under consultation. And I think the projects that one of the projects that was mentioned was climate related risk. Um, so I was just wondering how the uh, how the um, how, how you see the uh, development of standards, which are going to come out from that new board interact with with, with this one. Um, so given that management commentary is already under consultation, do you see the work of the new board slotting in seamlessly to the um, kind of uh, management commentary and also potentially other uh, projects that the uh, ISB is going to undertake? Or is that perhaps going to be, um, yeah, I, I don't know. How, how do you see the interaction between those two? Yes, this is an area where we, we've been receiving a lot of feedback and a lot of questions about. And one thing to be to remember is that it's uh, this is proposed International Sustainability Standards Board and any final decisions will be made before November this year. And um, if there is any interaction with the new uh, Sustainability Standards Board, that interaction will be included in the uh, in the board's priorities for the for the future. But it's too early to say uh, how that interaction can be. And uh, very specifically about management commentary, we we are not asking a specific question about existing projects in the request for information in this agenda consultation. But I know that some stakeholders uh, feel quite strongly about uh, this pausing or stopping some of the existing projects, and uh, and if they have strong views, that we would like to hear them as well. And I think I, I've heard from some stakeholders that probably management commentary is one of such projects to. To wait and see how that may interact with, with the proposed new International Sustainability Standards Board to seek some synergies with that board before finalizing that project. So, so there are mixed views, but uh, but indeed this is an area where we uh, we receive some questions. Um, if I may add, yeah, thanks, Tim. It's a great question. Um, we we would argue that there are things that are climate related. Uh, that belong within the financial statements. So you're probably aware of the um, education and guidance materials that we produced. Um, we've got two on our website. Um, one of them followed on from a publication of the AASB, the Australian Accounting Standards Board, and uh, Nick Anderson wrote one. And then we have another one published just at the end of last year. And in those documents, we outline particular standards where we think there needs to be disclosure that relates to climate related risk within financial statements as the standards currently stand. So it's our position that as these things are material now, 
companies need to be disclosing them and they need to be within financial statements. So there's that side and that continues irrespective of the developments. We're not waiting on the ISSB for that. But as um, Raffle says, the, the IASB, uh, should it come into existence, um, will we'll start with climate related disclosures. That's the plan, the first standard. Um, and, and then there'll be need to be decisions about where that material will appear. And management commentary is one place potentially where those type of disclosures could appear. And so if you do look into the management commentary um, practice statement ED, you can see there's a lot of um, guidance in there on environmental and social, um, less so governance, but certainly environmental and social. So there's a lot of discussion around environmental and social. And, and so as events unfold, we will see where the um, over the interaction uh, between financial statements, management commentary, and then the material that's generated in response to international sustainability standards, should we, should we get them? Thank you. Thanks, Tim, for the question. Uh, moving on to the next slide, I just wanted to mention that we have an open-ended question. Uh, if there are any comments on the board's activities and the work plan, uh, we would like to hear that from our stakeholders as well. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Anne to talk about two examples of described projects. Thanks, Thanks Rahul. Uh, we just added two slides here to give you an example of the detail that's in the RFI on particular projects. And so you can see the information that we've gathered over time and as we prepared for agenda consultation and prepared for the RFI we've taken notes of feedback that we've been given. And so this slide and the next one, if we can go to the next one as well, please, Ravel, um, just give you an indication of the detail. So if you're interested in commenting on a project, be it cash flows, segment reporting, or any of the other projects, climate related disclosures, um, intangible assets, if you look into the RFI, you can see the sort of feedback that we're acknowledging we've already received. And so you can see um, how your comments can add to what we've heard already. And also I thought if you are researching in a particular area and you'd like to make us aware of research that you know about or indeed that you've done yourself, um, you can see how it would fit in these outlines of the projects. So we are interested in research. Um, we've included the email for Anna Simpson on the last page of our slides. And the, Anna takes receipt of academic reports and studies that are sent to her. So with that, if we just go to the next slide um, and we look at, and the next one, please. Um, so here are all the links, back one. If we go back one, we can see the links for our web pages and where you can lodge your comments and so forth. Um, various articles that we have available and how to submit a comment letter or indeed complete the survey on agenda consultation. And then our final slide, um, we would direct you to our academic web page where there's lots of interesting news and so forth for academics and the address for Anna Simpson. Um, so that's all for me um, and I will pause now and we can have some more discussion. Yeah, no. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Anne and, and Raphael. Um, really interesting uh, to, to be able to go through all of that and obviously, you know, a few questions coming out of it. Um, for those who are on the call, I know the link's put up. Um, I've also put in, and I was having a quick look at it while, while we're talking about it, um, the third agenda consultation link uh, to the IFRS website. Um, and there's obviously a lot more detail through some of that documentation about what the details of some of those projects are and what could be done and, and the potential size because I suppose in my head trying to understand the size differentials between what could be you know a small medium or large project what that would that would actually entail um well what I'll do because I'm, I'm sure there's probably I could keep on keep on talking but um if there's anyone um I know you know it's a, it's a small group and, and people that do know Anne and obviously I've just met Raffle but if there are questions from any of the group um additional questions just feel free to take yourself off mute um, and, and jump on in. Um, otherwise, we're left with my DOS at times for the rest of the rest of the session.
or whilst everyone is getting I, this. No? If I can add uh, to what you said, David, about the, the estimate of a potential project size. So just to give you a flavor of what it, uh, how it's estimated. So for example, a potential project uh, that would include recognition and measurement requirements for intangibles is a large project. So that's, that would likely be a large project, but a project on providing more better disclosures about unrecognized intangibles that are internally generated would yeah. likely be slightly smaller project. So perhaps medium. So that's, that's, <laughs> uh, that's the way to look at, uh, at, at the project size and uh, similarly statement of cash flow, some targeted improvements. So for example, uh, better disclosures or better information about non-cash movements would likely be small to medium project. Whereas the, the, the over the, the complete review of, of the IS-7 would be large project. Yeah, no, that, that, that's fair enough and makes a lot of sense. Um, just had a thought and it's disappeared on me. Um, actually, no, no, it was in relation to the PIRs that you were showing in the various standards. And, you know, some of those I remember from, and, and it indicates that the time taken uh, to develop standards and develop them well, but and some of those, you know, leases have been around for quite some time. I remember leases being discussed when I was when I was there and insurance contracts. Um, you know, some of these have been in Genesis, and they do take time to get the consultation to get to get right to to you know get them to market. Um, do you have a feel? And this is uh, you know, personal opinion around what some of the because it feels like with revenue and with insurance and leases, like a lot of big things that had taken a while that, that really needed to get done have been done. Do you have a sense going forward of what the really big pressing matters of, of the day or of the next five years from your perspective look like? David, I think it depends who you ask, because if you ask <laughs> investors, they would yep. like something to be done on segments and on cash flow statements, which is why I chose to pop those two <laughs> up in the slides. Um, so it just, it just depends who you ask. Where, where people's priorities lie. But you, you know, you, you'd think that segments is done and dusted and you think cash flow statements, that's pretty old. Why does that need change? But you know, if you talk to people, they, they have major issues with those. So even though you say the big standards are done like leasing and revenue, yeah. if you talk to investors, there's still things that are quite pressing. Just before we get to, to Lindy, just to, to ask, because on cash flow statements, what, you know, in a nutshell, and that may be difficult to do. What are, what is the issue? Because I mean, around how they're set up, I and mean, what what's the concern sitting there? Um, there's always been a concern, been a concern about making financial institutions do cash flow statements. Doesn't okay. seem appropriate. Yep. Um, but there's also issues now coming out with the leasing standard that they, the the investors can't see the cash flows because of the way the leasing standard works yep. and the required disclosures. They can't see the cash flows as they'd like to see them. Um, there's issues around the choices that were available in the cash flow statement, but we are addressing those in the primary financial statements. Um, yep. But other than that, you'd need to go back into the document and have yeah. a look at the slide where I've got that slide. We, we In our pack, we have a slide um, on slide 31, the sorts of things that are still okay. concerns for um, for investors. There you go. I thought it was a fairly straightforward. I mean, I know you can construct things and there's a few wrinkles, but I thought it was relatively straightforward. But obviously, yeah. nothing in life really is. Um, I will but thank you for that. And I'll, I'll throw to Lindy, who's um, got a question. Thanks so much to Anne and Raphael and David for organizing this. Um, just your perspective on the IFRS taxonomy, the appetite for incorporating management commentary tags, um, what's your perspective for the future in that aspect? Um, Raffle, do you want to go first or do you want me to take this? Uh, you can take this on, please. Okay. Um, I think there's huge potential for tags in the IFRS taxonomy for management commentary because management commentary is part of the narrative information and the narrative information is in such demand and investors are really demanding that the, the information is tagged. So um, what I'm referring to, of course, is if you're following the discussions around the ISSB 
and the development of sustainability standards and sustainability information, which I know you are, Lindy, uh, that the people are asking for a taxonomy. They're asking for that to be digital. So that's going hand in hand, the idea that, that could we have these international sustainability standards? And at the same time, the information needs to be made available digitally, so there needs to be a taxonomy. And that, that's all bumping along. And, and so that, I think, makes people think, well, if it's so essential to have a taxonomy and tagged information for sustainability, is that not also true for management commentary, for that narrative information to be tagged as well? So there is some demand. Um, we can see data aggregators um, themselves going in and, and using tools and tagging the management commentary information. And make, so in this case, say in the US, the MDNA, but it can be wider than that, tagging that and making it available. Um, and they're doing that because they perceive a demand from investors. So I think it's one of those items that's on the watch list. And I think in time it will come. Thank you. Um, just also slightly related is in terms of the management commentary, uh, I think I can't quite recall all the details right now, but in relation to segmental perspectives within management commentary and tying into overall segmental perspectives, do you think that, well, I wondered if you had a view on that? just as we want to look at segments within financial reporting, what do you think the appetite is regarding the management commentary being looked at from a segmental perspective? Well, Lindy, I think we know in practice many entities do that. That's how they choose to present management commentary. Um, uh, uh, Raffles already referred today how some people think management commentary is outside financial statements and it's not, shouldn't be a focus area for the IASB. Uh, the reason that the IASB, one of the reasons, has invested so much time into management commentary is the importance of that narrative. But it's always that from a management perspective. And so management will choose the way the way that they present and the, the, the level and the connectedness and whether they reconcile things. On the point of reconciliation, I can say we, the board hears very clear feedback all the time on things reconciling. So if we're talking to investors and others about segments, and they do want to be able to reconcile various parts of segments to overall picture. Um, so often people are asking for segments and asking for clarity around different measures to be able to reconcile them. Um, but it's not something that's been discussed by the board that I can recall in terms of the board. The board would give plenty of guidance in management commentary practice statement, but um, uh, you know, that, that there's a lot of guidance there and a lot of direction about how management should present things. Um, but that's probably as much as I can say in, in, in answering that question. Um, you know, do, I, do I think there should be more more requirements that what appears in financial statements also appears in the narrative. Um, given, you know, we, it would be possible for a national standard setter to do that because they control the management commentaries, but given that the ISB doesn't control management commentaries, it, it, it's a difficult one for us to mandate what goes in financial statements and goes in management commentary. Um, but that said, it's going to be uh, topical as the, if the ISSB gets up and going, it'll be something that gets talked about, talked about a lot more. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lindy. David, if I may add uh, to your previous point about the priorities that we've heard so far, I think it's, it's quite useful uh, to mention. Uh, so the document was published at the end of March, so four months ago, and so far we've heard consistently that intangibles, cryptocurrencies, statement of cash flows, and climate-related risks, including pollutant pricing mechanisms, are top priorities for stakeholders and yep. for different types of stakeholders and across jurisdictions. But that's, that's just preliminary feedback, so we'll see if, that, if that's final feedback that we receive. Yeah, no, that all makes sense. And I suppose given... Um, yeah, given sort of the environment that we're in at the moment, all the you know, 
none of that, with the exception of maybe cash flows, because I wasn't sort of thinking so deeply about that. Um, yeah, all sort of seemed to jump out. I think Tim's got another question. Tim. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, I wasn't sure whether to ask this question, but since Rafael brought it up, um, and it's sort of like building on Mavis' previous question as well around the size of the projects. Um, so the bullet and uh, re relatedly to my uh, interest, um, so bulletin pricing mechanism, it is stated that it's likely to be a large project. Um, and I was slightly unsure about that because obviously the, uh, there was uh, an, an IFRIC um, previously, and I believe there was research projects around this area as well. So what was the consideration there to classify it as large project instead of medium or small perhaps? Well, there are, it's an emerging issue and there are lots of different types of bulletin pricing mechanisms. And just to provide requirements for different types across uh, jurisdictions, provide principles that would work across globally for different types, that would be, that would be a real challenge. And, and the previous research project shows that, that it wasn't that straightforward to provide any, any solution and any conclusions. That's why... Uh, we expect it would likely be large project, but but these are just estimates. So once the board decides on the project scope and and decides to add any project to its work plan, uh, scoping of any such project would be the next phase. But these are just rough estimates to help you respond to the consultation because we have provided this estimated future capacity two to three large projects or four to five medium projects or seven to eight small projects. So when you know the estimated size, you can already uh, see how it fits into the board's expected capacity for the next five years. So, uh, so, so these are estimates, but but the, but there are some uh, some lessons learned, and there is also some evidence about what to expect from any such potential project. That's why we have come up with with suggestion that it's rather a large project. Good. Yeah, no, thank you, Raffle, um, and Tim for, your, Tim, for your questions. It, given it's now gone seven past five, um, doesn't look like there are any additional, I'm just keeping an eye on, on the chat and whatnot, doesn't look like there's any additional questions coming through. So I think, um, as mentioned, there are links um, to the third agenda consultation, um, which I've made available. Um, there are obviously more links and, and details and documents within that. Um, the deadline is September, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, this 27. Bit of home, homeschooling and, and lockdown noise going on in the background. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's opportunity for, for you to, um, you know, if you are looking to um, engage with the IASB and certainly just a, a personal note on um, the IFRS Foundation and the IASB for those on the call is that it's it's very easy to on one level to think they're just a, a black box of this organisation based in London and you know there's no one to real that works with them and you can't ever get in touch with them. That from my from my perspective and my experience, that's um, absolutely not the case at all. So I know Anne is very engaged and, and um, very active participant in the community. So. I'm, I'm sure if you have questions or there, there are things that you want to clarify that um, sort of Anne or, or the rest of the you know, IFRS um, technical teams, someone will be willing or interested to hear from you on, on what you have what you have to say. Um, but I'd just like to at this junction juncture say thank you to, to Anne and to Raffle to for taking the time to speak with us. Um, really interesting and, and lots to go away and ponder and, and lots of reading. Um, for many of us to go and do. Um, but yeah, thank you again. Thanks very much, David. And thanks to all our participants. It's been great to be with you today. Thanks to Tim at AFANS as well. Thank you.